There's nothing more on the minds and thoughts of parents than the raising of your children. <clears throat> Whether you're doing a good job or a bad job, what mistakes you've made that may have resulted in mistakes they're making, how we can become better parents, what we can do to improve the life of our children in the direction in which they're going. Sometimes we think we're doing a good job, usually when our children are really young. And sometimes we think, well, maybe I didn't do such a great job after our children get older. And maybe as they become adults themselves, we see in their lives mistakes that we made that we probably pass along to them. So there's a lot on the minds of parents every day of their lives based upon their children. And I hope we can say some things this morning that will help young parents as they begin to raise their children, help us who are grandparents. After our children have already left home, we can help our children raise their children in different ways, through our prayers, through our example, our indirect influence. So the business of raising children really never leaves those of us who are parents. Let's keep that in mind, and these thoughts that we observed this morning will be a benefit to all of us, not just those who have young children at this particular time. From a brief overview of Scripture of both Old and New Testaments, we come to the conclusion and we can discern an almost singular duty that God has given to children. And that duty relates to their parents. Children are to respect and obey their parents in the Lord. Notice the following citations. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12 says, This is the fourth of the Ten Commandments. Children are to honor your father and mother. Also, the wisdom of Solomon, Solomon reflects that same thought, where he says in Proverbs 23 and verse 22, Listen to your father and mother who begot you, and do not despise your mother when she is old. So children are taught from the very earliest ages, hopefully from the Bible, by their parents, to respect God, to respect His Word, and to obey their parents, to always remember the instruction that their parents give them, and never to forget either their parents in regard to your love and regard for them, and do not forget the instructions that they give you. So now turning our attention to the New Testament, we see in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 20, Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. In passages like this throughout the Bible, where the duties of children are under consideration, even though the text and the language may vary, the basic message is the same. Children are to honor, respect, and obey their parents. Although the command that children respect and obey their parents is the most common charge laid upon children. It is not the most important charge laid upon children. We read in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 1, to remember your Creator in the days of your youth. The reality is that a child's attitude toward his or her parents in youth sets the stage for what attitude they will express toward God as they grow older. It is God's will that children honor, respect, and obey mother and father so that they will ultimately learn to honor, love, respect, and obey God Almighty. God being their heavenly Father. The idea of God being our heavenly Father relates directly to the fact that He is a Father in contrast to the earthly Father. That we have. There's some similarities there. There is a continuum of attitude that a child should have that extends from his earthly parents to his godly, heavenly parent. And if the attitude toward earthly parents is taught correctly by parents, that is biblically, 
then that attitude will also be reflected in the child's attitude toward God as they grow older. So throughout our society, we can witness a lack of respect on everyone's part, a lack of honor and respect on the part of children toward not only their families, but all forms of authority, including that of their parents. And unfortunately, such an attitude on the part of young folks toward authority is not new. To one extent or another, it has characterized every generation. We picked that up very quickly in the Word of God, going all the way back to the very first family. Adam and Eve, the very first couple, had children. They had Cain and Abel. And Cain slew his brother Abel. There was murder in the first family. There was a digression from things they had been taught. We knew they were taught by God. They had been taught by their parents more than likely to respect and obey and respect God's word. They had been taught what type of sacrifice to offer to God. Abel offered a pleasing sacrifice. Cain did not. Was there anything in the relationship between Cain and his parents that resulted in his disobedience? The Bible doesn't bring anything specifically out. But Cain allowed sin to enter into his heart, and it corrupted his attitude toward God and toward God's instructions. And I know that must have broken Adam and Eve's heart to see their son sin in such a way. And no doubt it caused them to reflect upon their attitude toward their son their business of raising children, they made a mistake that led into that. Maybe they'll never know, we'll never know. But it's something that weighs upon the hearts of parents. We all need to be concerned with regard to teaching our children what the Bible says about respecting Him. You know, children are a great source of sadness and disappointment toward parents on occasion. They are a great source of distress a great source of anxiety, a great source of worry, a great source of concern. All parents express these emotions toward their children. Their children sometimes make them sad. Sometimes they disappoint their parents. We are distressed sometimes in reference to things they get involved with. We're anxious about them. We're concerned about their safety, about things they are being uh, engaging in their activities and their behavior and the habits that they form, the people that they associate with, the friends that they make, who they want to marry, how they're going to raise their children, and there are many sources of pain. But children are also a source of great and tremendous joy. If you would turn to Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 1, Proverbs, the 10th chapter, verse 1, you are well aware, no doubt, if you are a Bible student, that the book of Proverbs has an awful lot to say to children and to parents in the raising of those children. And here in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 1, it makes the very point that we just made. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is a grief of his mother. A wise son. What is a wise son? A wise son is one who makes good decisions as he's growing older. Who takes that knowledge and information given to him or her by his parents and they put it to good use. They use wisdom in the way that they see life. The way that they react to problems and situations that they come in contact with. They use wisdom. But that wisdom comes from instruction, knowledge that their parents give them. But on the other hand, a foolish son, one who does not use the wisdom, one who does not pay attention to the knowledge and information that his parents give him or her, they are a source of grief to their mother. But it's not mere chance, as I've already indicated, that some parents are made sad by their children, while other parents are made glad by their children. For the most part, it goes back to how they were raised. The same writer of the book of Proverbs tells us, if we train up a child in the way that he goes, when he is old, he will not depart from it. 
So how a child turns out depends to a great degree, generally speaking, as to how they were raised. Train up a child the way he should go. He may depart from that, but he'll have something to come back to once he's made mistakes and come to his senses like the uh, the son in uh, Proverbs chapter 10 who was prodigal or who ran away, who was rebellious. He finally came to his senses and came back to his father. But he not just came back to his father, he came back to the discipline of his father. He came back to the instruction of his father. He came back to the order of his father. He came back to that which he ran away from because he knew that what he ran away from was better than what he came up with on his own. So he went through a tough time, a tough patch as we might say, as did his father. He dragged his father through that tough patch. But they were reunited. And his father received him back just like God receives his prodigal children when we sin and come back to him. So there was both sadness, disappointment, distress, anxiety, worry, and concern in that relationship between the prodigal son and his father, but there was also great and tremendous joy and happiness in that as well. And that was based upon his knowledge of knowing what was right, his repentance, his desire and decision to come back to that which was good. And in the end, they all lived happily ever after, you might say. I want to present two terms that are necessary for us to understand in terms of raising children. One of them is susceptibility. A key word in our study today is susceptibility. The word is defined as easily affected emotionally, having sensitive feelings, or being responsive. And the point I want to make for this word susceptibility is that children are susceptible. And it's certainly true of children. They are susceptible to the approval of their parents. They are eager to please. They're eager to learn. They're eager to emulate. They're eager to be directed. But they're also eager or susceptible to being misdirected. They're like sponges. They soak in whatever is in their environment. If their parents give them wise instructions based upon the wisdom of the Word of God, then they will take that in and they will learn from it. But if they are given the wrong information that they will get from the world, there's no doubt about it, what they're getting from the world is going to be bad most of the time. And it's not going to lead them toward God. What they get from the world will lead them away from God. They are susceptible to that, just as they are susceptible to wisdom that they might gain from their parents. So parents need to understand that how susceptible their children are, how eager they are to please, and parents need to take advantage of that. Young people like to be, like to have the approval of their of their parents. You know, when a young child, a young child comes home with a paper from school, or maybe draws a simple little stick man figure on a piece of paper. They hand that to mom and dad, all they want is a smile. You know, you give them that smile and they'll return it to you because that makes them, that made their day. You make your children's day by approving of what they do. They want your approval. They desire it. They yearn for it. They live every day wanting the approval of their parents. And hopefully that will last throughout life. And it will enter into their spiritual arena when they desire the approval of God as well. Because they have a loving father, they can relate to a loving God. And they will desire his approval. And that will pay great benefit for them throughout their life. Because if they do what's right, they will be approved by God. God will accept them as a faithful child, not as a prodigal child. So this idea of susceptibility is an emotional concept of children that parents need to understand. Uh, parents need to give their children proper direction and to do everything that they can do to counteract the misdirection they receive from the world, knowing how susceptible they are. No so parents seem to think, well, as long as I teach them in the home, I don't have to worry about what they're taught out in the world. 
And so they give their children the right and the, the uh, time and, and the, the loose reins to go out into the world and learn whatever they can learn from the world. Sometimes parents need to restrict that. Sometimes parents need to say, no, I'm not going to let you go out with those boys or those girls. I'm not going to let you go to this particular place at this particular time. I'm going to try to counteract the behavior that you're developing based on the influence of these ungodly friends. And sometimes children do not understand why there's so many no's. But parents in their wisdom understand that the more time they spend with people of the world, the more like the world they're going to become. You know, people live what they're used to. You know, sometimes you'll hear of a woman who's married to an alcoholic husband. And she has so much trouble, always calling the preacher. I remember when I was growing up, it seems like we just had this habit of moving in next to an alcoholic man. And there were a lot of them that came out of World War II. Uh, my father was that age, and all my children's fathers fought in World War II. A lot of them became alcoholics during the war because of what they experienced there, a lack of ability to overcome that. And... Uh, so that woman who's married to an alcoholic, maybe her husband dies, or maybe they, they're divorced, and that marriage splits up for better or for worse. And then all of a sudden, after a year or two, she marries again. And more often than not, who's she going to marry? Another alcoholic. Because that's what she's used to. People live the way they're used to living, for better or for worse. And if a child spends a more inappropriate amount of time out in the world absorbing what the world says and teaches him through their example and through their uh, behavior and so forth, they're going to accept that because it's what they've lived with. So parents need to understand that and should limit the amount of time that they spend in the world. And it's difficult because you're going to have problems with your children. There will be disagreements. There will be temper tantrums, maybe, or rebellion, or they'll give you the quiet treatment or the silent treatment. Things like that happen, but parents need to stand firm and always be willing and ready to tell their children why. They're saying no. Why are they being restricted in reference to the amount of time they spend out in the world? And the parents need to understand why. They're just not saying no just because they're being mean, or they have an end for their child. That was a popular saying back when I was a kid, oh, he's, my parents has it in for him. My dad has it in for him. Uh, that better not be the reason why a child is disciplined by his parents. It better be for his ultimate good. And a parent should be able to explain to his children the scriptural, rational, reasonable explanation for why he's being restricted in the amount of time they spend out of the world. Because the child, again, is susceptible to what he or she lives with. And they spend enough time out in the world, regardless of what mom and dad says. You know, some kids spend more time watching television and being influenced by the television and when, nowadays by their cell phones than the amount of time they spend listening to their parents. And parents sometimes think, I guess, we think, well, they're in my house. They're going to spend the 18 years with me. And uh, as long as they spend that time with me, that's really all I need to be concerned about. They're getting everything they need. Well, that needs to be quality time. And we need to restrict the cell phone usage or the television time and spend time studying God's Word, praying with our children, teaching them in our instruction as to how they need to live. So that's what the parent's duty is to recognize their child's susceptibility and make sure that they are receiving direction from God's Word. The uh, way that we do this is in large degree summed up by a second key that's important, the key word, not just susceptibility, we need to understand that, we also need to understand the part that discipline plays. Discipline, the idea of discipline, conjures up sometimes all sorts of horrible visions in the mind of a child. Some children think of discipline as being cruel, unreasonable, harsh, punishment. But it's absolutely unnecessary for children and parents to understand the part that 
healthy discipline plays in the life of a family. God has given responsibilities to parents, particularly the father, to discipline their children. If you turn to a passage, I know you're familiar with Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. I'd like to read that from the New American Standard Version. Ephesians 6 and verse 4 says, And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Parents are to bring their children up in the discipline and the instruction of the, of the Lord. The Greek word translated discipline here in Ephesians 6 and verse 4 means the training of a child, including instruction, its correction, and chastening. Those things are all important in bringing up a child in the way that he should go. Discipline is part of that. We might refer to discipline as teaching, giving instruction. It's also necessary that uh, corporal discipline be a part of that. Corporal discipline would be like spanking or uh, some type of punishment of that nature. <clears throat> and I know in my experience, having raised five children, that if you discipline them corporally, that is spanking, when they were very young, you didn't have to spank them very often. Just a few at a younger age, uh, <coughs> usually did the work that needed to be done, especially for your girls. We had four girls and one boy. I spanked the boy more than I did the girls, but not inappropriately, not a great amount of spankings. He got a few more, but the girls, they were very susceptible to uh, uh, wanting to please their parents. So they were more uh, amenable to our instruction. They didn't get any trouble. I particularly was a very incorrigible kid. I got a lot of spankings. And when I got into middle school, those spankings became whoopings. <laughs> I got a few of those. And every time I think about that subject, I think of Mr. Davidson. He was a vice principal of Bessemer Junior High School. And I got into a lot of trouble when I was in junior high. And on three or four different occasions during that three year period of junior high school, I was sent to the vice principal's office. And if necessary, I have to bend over and grab my ankles. And I get three or four swats, and that's putting that lightly, from this paddle that was about that long with the handle, that hose drilled in it. And you know why they had holes drilled in that paddle? So we could swing it faster. There would be less force against that paddle if he had those holes in it. But that didn't keep him from hurting any. I never felt those holes. I felt the paddle. And I'd get three or four squats from that paddle. I wouldn't feel them at first. But then after a few seconds, it would kick in, and I'd know I'd been paddled. They don't do that anymore, obviously. It's considered to be child abuse. I think it did me some good. By the time I got into high school, I didn't need to be spanked anymore by the vice principal. But uh, if we will teach our children and instruct them and discipline them in a reasonable, loving way, then the child will respond to that. And you won't be spanking a child when he's 15 or 16 years old if you handle that in the right way when they're younger. And uh, we need to understand that. The old saying, when it comes to teaching our children, including discipline, sometimes parents will say, do as I say, but not as I do. Well, that's not going to get the job done. Because an important aspect of teaching children is to make sure that they are giving a good example of how to live. Children, just like adults, would rather see a sermon than hear one any day. And seeing a sermon in your parents as to how they are to live in a holy manner toward God, being consistent and faithful to the Lord, will be a better sermon to that child than listen to the local preacher preach for 10 or 15 years. What he sees in his parents, he sees discipline in his parents. 
If he sees discipline in his parents, he will more likely accept discipline in his own life. And he will apply his self-discipline to himself as he continues to grow older. Turn, if you would, to a couple of passages of Scripture in uh, the Old Testament as to how we need to make sure we teach our children. The Bible is replete in both Testaments with the need for parents to instruct their children. And I'm turning, first of all, to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today will, shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. These instructions are given. It was essential for the Israelites, God's Old Testament people, to do these things daily. And it's just as essential for parents today to instruct their children on a daily basis. To make sure that the Word of God, the discipline of God's Word, the instructions of God's Word, the direction of God's Word, is a part of, very practical part of our family life. And they see it in our words, they see it in our example, they see it in our self-discipline. So it's important. We read this morning in the reading from Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. And I know you're familiar with the book of Proverbs. It has an awful lot to say to children and to parents in the raising of children. The first seven chapters of Proverbs are specifically addressed to children. My son, Solomon says. The first seven chap verses of, first of uh, Proverbs chapter 1 talk about the importance of wisdom and instruction, and uh, discretion, and understanding, learning those things. And then in chapter 1 and verse 8, he says, My son, do the instruction of your father, and do not forsake the law of your mother. In chapter 2 and verse 1, My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom, and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment, and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver, and search for her as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. Furthermore, in chapter 3, and verse 1 of Proverbs, My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. In chapter 3, and, uh, or rather, chapter 4, or yeah, chapter 3 and verse 11, as we continue, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. Notice how this reflects upon instruction as well as corporal punishment. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. What is chastening? Chastening is correction. Chasing name is punishment. Do not detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects. Sometimes spankings are a part of correction. And we need to accept that as parents, not be afraid to spank our children, or to discipline them, whatever the situation requires and calls for. Because a father who delights in his son is going to correct that son as he needs to be corrected. Then in chapter 4 and verse 1, Hear, my children, the instruction of a father, and give attention to no understanding. Chapter 4 and verse 20, My son, give attention to my words, incline your ear to my sayings. Do not depart from them. Then in chapter 5 and verse 1, My son, pay attention to my wisdom, lend your ear to my understanding, that you may preserve discretion and your lips may keep knowledge. Chapter 6 and verse 1, My son, if you become surety for your friend, if you have shaken hands and pledged for a stranger, 
You are snared by the words of your mouth. You are taken by the words of your mouth. So do this, my son, and deliver yourself. So there's some specific instructions given pertaining to instructions from ultimately God. And then finally, chapter 7, verse 1. My son, keep my words and treasure my commands within you. Keep my commands and live. And the law as an apple, and my law as an apple of your eye. If children are taught correctly and consistently by way of instruction and example by their parents, they will be an honor to their parents, they will be an honor to Almighty God, and in the process, they will be a blessing to themselves. They will find happiness, and they will find fulfillment in obeying God's law. In Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6, a passage that we referred to a moment ago, Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So the idea here of training up a child is mentioned, it's emphasized. Train up a child in the way that he should go when he is old, as we mentioned earlier, he will have something to come back to. He will not depart from it, hopefully when he is old. But then down in verse 15, in connection with verse 6, that talks about training, verse 15 says, Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it far from him. So there's a connection between training and corporal discipline when necessary. Children can be very foolish, as this verse points out. The heart of a child is bound in foolishness, he said. Parents need to understand that, that they're prone to go the way of the world, the easiest way, the way that they're most influenced to go, that's the way of the world, and they can become very foolish. And when a parent sees a child becoming foolish in that way, he needs to pull in the reins and say, wait a minute, what you're doing is not wise, what you're doing is foolish, and it will hurt you in the long run. And it may be necessary to child to exercise this type of corporal punishment. So parents must be willing to back up their oral instructions, not just with their example, but with corporal discipline when necessary. Proverbs chapter 29 again, and uh, two verses from Proverbs 29, verse 15 and 17. The rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Verse 17, correct your son, and he will give you rest. Yes, he will give delight to your soul. So all these instructions from the Word of God teach us how important it is to be self-disciplined as a parent, to teach our children the instructions of the Lord, to be give a good example of fulfilling those instructions ourselves, and then instilling to the best of our ability the desire on the part of our children to exercise self-discipline and to learn the Word of God themselves. They will learn everything about God's Word when they're in our home. But if they're taught correctly, they will be given in the home a desire to continue to learn God's Word. And hopefully as they grow older, they will continue to study and read and become even more knowledgeable in the Word of God, more loving toward God, and more obedient toward God, and more pleasing in God's eyes. Well, that's the lesson this morning. I appreciate your kind attention, and I hope that what I've said, even though it goes against the world's view of how to raise children, it should not go against our view. You know, how often have you heard on television or in different uh, types of social media, the word obey, the word obedience, the word obey, it's just not there anymore. You ever hear it kids and children? being spoken of in the context of you must obey your children or your, your teacher or children must obey their parents. You know, it's not that you don't hear that word anymore. It's gone out of style. It's the old foggy type of language. It's thrown into the dustbin of history according to the world. But it still should be on the thoughts and in the hearts of children whose parents are Christians and it should be on the mind and the hearts of Christians who are trying to raise their children. It should be on our minds because we know how important discipline is. We know how important obedience is. 
and what our children are being taught in our homes is going to be reflected in their attitude toward God, whether they ultimately obey God or disobey God. Because obedience is a very important and a very uh, consistent, replete concept in the Word of God. And our children should not be afraid to hear that word. We should not be afraid to utter that word in their presence because God expects all men everywhere to be obedient. I'd like to conclude by reading one verse from 3 John, the third letter of John, in verse 4, where he says, and he was an old man at this point, having spent his life teaching people about Christ, baptizing them into the body of Christ, seeking to strengthen churches made up often of those whom he had taught personally, and a source of great joy on the part of the Apostle John is mentioned here in 3 John and verse 1. He says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And that ought to be the goal. And that ought to inspire all of us as parents to have the same goal in mind in reference to our children. He has no greater joy than to know that his parents are walking obediently to the Lord. So let's raise our children and with that goal in mind. Seeking through our example, seeking through our teaching and instruction, seeking through our own self-discipline to raise our children in the Lord, they will be pleasing to God, they will bring glory to God, and they'll bring happiness to us as parents as well. Pick up your hymn book at this time and turn to the number that Joss has selected the song of encouragement. Happens to be anyone on a number that needs to respond to the word of God. To become a Christian or to repent of sin that you've committed and stand between you and God at this time. You need the prayers of the church to help you become reunited with God. This invitation to respond is offered to you now as together we stand and as we sing.